Thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name is Dan Fisk. I am uh, currently with something called the International Republican Institute, uh, known as IRI. Uh, it is a non-governmental organization that works internationally. Uh, we only have, we have no formal affiliation with the Republican Party. It's a loose affiliation primarily through our chairman, who is Senator John McCain, the Republican from Arizona. And we primarily work with uh, political parties, civil society organizations, and governmental entities around the world. We do not work domestically in the, in the United States. So I, I am here representing a general Republican point of view. Um, I'm not here uh, formally on behalf of the Trump campaign. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out myself uh, what is the Trump campaign. So I will talk to the best I can about uh, what I call the Trumpian foreign policy, uh, which is not necessarily the same as the Republican foreign policy. Uh, just as a bit of a biographical note, I think one of the reasons I am here is I work for three Republican or in three Republican administrations. I uh, have worked for Republicans in the United States Senate and worked for Republicans in the House of Representatives. So I think I actually know what a Republican looks like, talks like, and how they think. Uh, and this has presented a bit of a challenge in terms of how I to describe Donald Trump, who will be, uh, I have no doubt, will be the uh, formally anointed as the Republican nominee in about uh, 10 days in, um, in Cleveland, Ohio. And I, I, will, I will start with, uh, uh, again, kind of putting this into, I think, some context for, for this group in particular. And, and that is, is that we are at a unique moment in terms of kind of what the Republican Party uh, has represented and will represent with, a, with Donald Trump, either as, uh, I should say, both as a candidate and should he be elected president as president of the United States. This is a party that has stood for strong alliances, has stood for not only having the U.S. market open, but has been uh, seen to leverage that to open other markets that's been strongly supportive of promoting democracy and human rights around the world, uh, has seen itself as not only a country that welcomes migrants and understands the value that they bring to our country, in fact, almost all of us uh, can trace our roots back to somewhere else in terms of our family history, and has very much embraced that. It's also a party that has changed some of its views on defense and national security since the attacks of September 11, 2001, with more of a focus on uh, a, a, what we call homeland security. Uh, it's not been to walk away from our international commitments, but to focus more on what we need to do to secure the homeland. What we see with Mr. Trump's emergence is an interesting phenomenon, and that is questioning our alliances, Mr. Trump has made it clear that he thinks that the Europeans have had a free ride, that, 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 that no expense to them, um, that NATO has actually been an economic, to the economic detriment of the United States, uh, ignoring the fact that NATO helped win the Cold War and bring down the Soviet Union. Apparently that wasn't, that's not worth anything now. We need to, re, we need to rebalance is what he says in that regard. Uh, he does agree in terms, this is where I think he is close to the Republican Party, we need to defeat terrorists. Now, uh, Mr. Trump has been a little vague on what that means. Uh, other Republicans have, have been a little bit more uh, vocal in terms of that, but, uh, but at this point that we don't have any details on, on Trump's foreign policy. There is agreement we need to do a better job of securing our borders, and that is one place where the Republican Party has changed over the last decade uh, in terms of going from the party that promoted under George W. Bush a comprehensive immigration reform to a party now that is deeply, deeply divided on what immigration reform means and what the standard is uh, that would allow us to move on, on immigration, uh, or changing elements of our immigration uh, policy uh, on that. Of course, another area that we've seen is trade. Uh, and this is, again, another change in 10 years. Um, it, it was a matter that Republicans could be counted upon uh, by, as a default position that we were going to support and would support free trade agreements. That is, again, opening uh, the U.S. market, uh, but also making sure that American investors had a level playing field in countries where they had investments. And so on trade, we have seen that we have had initiatives start by Republicans. Uh, in the case of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that was started under 
uh, George H. W. Bush, who we call Bush 41, um, and carried across the finish line by Bill Clinton. But for Bill Clinton to have uh, helped bring that to a successful conclusion required a majority of Republicans in the Congress. And we saw again what President uh, George W. Bush did, Bush 43, on trade, and we saw what President Clinton did, I'm sorry, uh, President Obama did, in terms of also moving the trade agenda forward, with finally uh, having the enactment of Colombia and Panama. And again, he had to get Republican, a majority of Republican congressmen to support that. And then President Obama, of course, has embraced the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which at least the Republican Speaker of the House has embraced. All of that, Mr. Trump says, he's now going to rip up. Um, and that uh, is, again, a unique uh, moment for Republicans that uh, we would have a uh, candidate that would take uh, basically more than 40 years of American international economic policy and now say we're going to rip it up uh, in terms of what that, that means. And as you all have maybe seen in the press here, a number of us who, are, who identify as Republicans are struggling uh, with how to reconcile what has been a traditional position uh, with, um, with Mr. Trump. Clearly, the Mexicans have taken the brunt of this. They have been singled out, uh, both as a country and as individual uh, nationals, uh, in terms on, on, on immigration, for example, and on trade. Uh, NAFTA has had an undercurrent of criticism and, uh, criticism and a great deal of skepticism since it was enacted. But in some cases, we've never had it vocalized uh, as we have had in this campaign. Nor, to go back to my comment about NATO, has NATO been questioned? Yes, at times we've all questioned about the cost sharing that goes into these alliances, whether it's NATO or the Japanese or the South Koreans, but no one's ever questioned it in a way that has put, potentially put those relationships uh, at risk. As far as the policy towards Latin America, again, I would say the two parties and Peter can comment on this from the Democrat view, but the two parties have largely come to a consensus upon what the parameters are for the United States of engaging with the Western Hemisphere. We have had our fights over Cuba. In this case, I think Cuba is no longer the issue it was politically. President Obama has taken care of that. Um, and so we're moving on. A point I'll make on that, I would say that Republicans as a majority still are skeptical about engaging with the Castro regime. Mr. Trump has made it clear he's fine with the policy as it is. Uh, again, showing a little bit of kind of out of step uh, with what we would consider, or I would consider, mainstream Republican policy. The fact of the matter is, is this has made no difference. The Republicans had an open democratic primary process. Mr. Trump uh, emerged, first with a plurality, and then with a clear majority. He, I mean, he won the primaries. He won the most delegates. And that is the circumstance in which uh, we all find ourselves in today. What's going to influence the election, the American voter, come November? It's a good question. I'll preempt a couple of questions right now on that and say, I don't think Brexit to the average American voter is going to be a factor at all come November. It may be an interesting historical footnote for the United States, clearly more than a footnote for the British in the United Kingdom. But for the average American, my own analysis is, is that if you already support Hillary Clinton, what happened with Brexit will confirm your view of Hillary Clinton. If you're already skeptical of international arrangements and support Donald Trump, Brexit is going to confirm your view of, of, of Mr. Trump's view about international, uh, kind of what we would call in America, international entanglements, uh, which to some Americans, the European Union looks like the ultimate international entanglement. So there are people who believe in some ways that the British just took their country back, just as. Donald Trump is asking Americans to take their country back. So it will be an interesting set of actions. In some cases, Peter and I have kind of said this partly seriously, partly tongue-in-cheek. The election in November may be influenced more by where it rains than where it doesn't rain in the United States. And that could be a factor as well. But I think we're in for an interesting time, not only politically, because all the conventional wisdom about presidential politics has been defied and stood on its head with Trump's emergence. And what happens in November and a President Trump is an open question. I'll end on this one note. What happens if we get a President Trump? My own view is, is that American institutions 
as much under question as they are, and in part Trump is a reaction or is a, a reflection of an underlying American skepticism uh, about institutions and politicians, but nonetheless they are still fundamentally sound. They still operate upon the basis of self-preservation. And a president still, a United States president, who looks very powerful to the outside, is actually not so powerful inside. He still must respond, in some cases it may be a she, uh, will have to respond to Congress in the sense the president cannot spend money unless Congress is appropriated. There's still a bureaucracy that can delay, obstruct, impede the wishes of a president. There's a lot of factors, and then there's also the courts. And as President Obama has discovered, courts don't agree with the president on every issue. And so we have the institutions in place that if there is a Trump presidency, he's not going to be able to wave his hand as if he's sitting in his Trump Tower penthouse in New York and say, I want to buy this building or that building. The U.S. government doesn't work that way. So he's going to be, I think, in for a rude awakening. And maybe the best we can hope for in the end is stalemate. Uh, the government just keeps going along, but stalemate. But I also realize that has a cost for the country and the world. So I'll end there and turn over to you. Thank you all.